Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to another edition of More Tea Vicar. We have another program uh, full of uh, interesting things uh, for you, uh, music, reflections, um, and we are getting ready for Stir Up Sunday. So lots to look forward to today. Well, it's uh, the news now, and it's been another week in lockdown, and nothing, it seems, is clear uh, what will be happening when we come out of this present lockdown on the 2nd of December. Um, as I read this news to you, uh, there has been some suggestion uh, that um, the Prime Minister will make an announcement that there will be a five-day break from uh, any kind of lockdown over the Christmas period, but we're yet to confirm that. So we continue to stay hopeful that we may have some kind of Christian Christmas in our churches. Well, thank you very much to all of you who still are sending me various uh, cuttings and various letters from tabloid newspapers regarding the Church of England. The matters of financial constraints put on individual parishes in the light that dioceses are not relenting against um, asking for their full common fund or parish share rumbles on. Our own Diocese of Salisbury issued a letter to all church treasurers and incumbents over the last week to thank everyone for all they do and to remind parishes that they will not be increasing the common fund apportionment uh, in 2021 and that it will stay the same, the same rate as um, 2020. Well, like many parishes and uh, our own at Holy Trinity, um, trying to raise, as we have to, over £54,000 a year is uh, quite a challenge and uh, we have not been able to do that this year and it's very unlikely we will be able to do it next year either. Although I have to say we try very hard and like all parishes we are all suffering, all of us, from a lack of regular giving. Because of Covid and lockdown and many church treasurers are raising their concerns about uh, common funds or quotas with their archdeacons. I read an article only this week of one rural parish, not in our own diocese, I have to say, who had taken to the newspaper to write a letter saying that they had written to their own diocese to say that they haven't even got enough money as a PCC to pay their day-to-day -day running uh, costs and any bills. So it would be impossible for them to pay um, a common fund apportionment to the diocese. In fact, the church warden who wrote the article says that they are now considering closing their church building permanently. How sad um, that is, and I hope and pray that uh, this will not uh, begin to happen in churches uh, up and down the country. But times are hard, not just for um, the church, but all around us. In another news item, I read a comment which said that the government are supporting every other organisation with financial help, but the Church of England has been left to fend for itself. Well, in defence of the Church of England, the Bishop of Exeter, who is the lead bishop for rural affairs, says that the church commissioners remain committed to supporting rural parishes and give more to rural ministry than urban. And he goes on to say that the Church of England plans to distribute over £900 million to support the church's work by 2022. 
And these funds are targeted to support lower income communities, increasing the support for those taking part in ordination training and to provide grants for communities with projects to expand their local church. He went on to say that financial contributions are necessary from every parish for the church to run and pay their clergy. Other news which rumbles on is the government's stance on uh, the decision to close places of worship during lockdown. I must say that the Archbishop of York, um, Stephen Cottrell, wrote a very good article in The Telegraph last week entitled Politicians Are Wrong to Treat Churches Like Bingo Halls. And this was a response from both archbishops and many leading clergy about the place of faith communities in our society who wanted to put down a marker regarding the place of faith communities within the life and well-being of our nation and the nature and place of worship as central to our identity, purpose and motivation. The bishops stated in a letter to the Prime Minister that worship is not a leisure pursuit like bingo halls and cinemas. Worship is essential in other ways. It shapes identity and purpose. The outcome, of course, as we know, was a compromise. Hence, our churches can be open for individual private prayer, but not at this time for congregational worship. Well, I was telling you last week in um, this part of our news programme uh, that the amount of criminal activity um, in Dorset um, amongst uh, churches had increased. Well, it, I have now a more full report um, of uh, that article. There were 66 recorded crimes in Dorset alone, but across the UK there were 5,831 crimes reported at churches and religious buildings. After 40 of 45 UK police forces responded to the Freedom of Information request. The Countryside Alliance, which campaigns on rural issues, has compiled the data from across the country into a report for its membership. And this includes 946 cases of violence, 1,750 of criminal damage, and 2,152 of thefts, of which 278 relate to lead and other metal theft. A spokesman for the diocese said, our own diocese uh, I am alluding to, said that it was disappointing to hear this news and went on to say that the Diocese of Salisbury works hard within parishes to make sure suitable precautions are taken to minimise these kinds of actions as the church is at the heart of every Dorset community and before Covid-19 was encouraged to be open during daylight hours. Well, now to our local church news. As you know, our churches are closed for public worship at present, but open on a Friday between 10 and 12 noon for individual prayer. Thank you to the few people who are doing the stewarding for the church at Holy Trinity Weymouth to be opened. It is good that people from our local community are taking the time to pop in and sit quietly, pray and reflect. And you are welcome. I can now officially announce that the Chris Stingle service that we would normally have on Christmas Eve has been cancelled because of COVID-19 and because we cannot have large gatherings. However, we are going to go virtual this year. We're working with our church families and our school to organise a service online. So you will be able to take part and to watch a Christingle online. 
There will also be an opportunity to donate to the work of the Children's Society via the church website. Once you get onto the website, you will see at the bottom of the page a donate button. Um, please press that and you will see um, the um, second button to press to donate to the Children's Society. The uh, web address is www.holytrinityweymouth.org. We hope that the virtual Christingle will uh, go live on the 18th of December. So please do, um, as members of our church, uh, as members of our community here in Weymouth, and every family uh, in your home, take part. We were planning also on having an Advent carol service on Sunday the 29th of November in Holy Trinity Church. Sadly, because of lockdown, we cannot have that physically now, but we are now working on putting together a virtual Advent carol service so that you can watch it in your homes online. I hope that you will be able to um, access it again through the church uh, website. We also have a YouTube channel and a Facebook channel you can access all our services, including our Advent Carol service and Chris Tingle service from any of those um, places. We hope that uh, you will feel able to make um, a donation towards um, both the Chris Tingle and to the church if you've enjoyed the hard work that has gone on in making these virtual services, which take such a long time. We're still hoping, and hoping at this stage is um, um, a really important word because we are hoping uh, to have our Nine Lessons and Carol service in church on Christmas Eve at 4pm. So we just hope that this will still happen. I'll keep everyone posted on this. And I'm to tell you this morning that um, next Thursday will be the last edition of More Tea Vicar for this year. However, we shall continue to come together again each Thursday at the same time for another programme for the season of Advent called Circle of Light. And in that uh, programme each week during Advent, we will explore together the powerful themes of darkness and light centred around the Advent wreath. The circle that never ends, just as God's love never ends for each one of us. So slightly different as from Thursday the 3rd of December as we join in the circle of light. More tea vicar will be back when we take tea again together outside in the sunshine, when it's dry and warm. So that's the end of all our news today. Now James and Lizzie are going to perform for us Pie Jesu. The words are very simple and sung in Latin and read, Merciful Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world, Grant them rest, everlasting rest.
Thank you. That was beautifully sung, Lizzie. Beautifully sung. Well, now I'm inviting uh, Bishop Andrew again to uh, give us another one of his going to ground uh, reflections. Um, Andrew is a parish priest at heart and loves the countryside. And it's lovely how he is able to relate what's going on in the world, its history, uh, to the faith that we all proclaim together. So over to Bishop Andrew Rumsey. Good morning, welcome back. It's been too long. <laughs> it's good to be with you again. Uh, for the first time in a long time, I've come out for an early morning walk uh, to spend some time with God and nature and with you. And I'm in a field called Piggledean, delightfully named Piggledean. Uh, which is uh, a, a boulder stream, the first part of our county in Wiltshire to be owned by the National Trust, I believe, at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, these are sarsen stones, uh, each of them uniquely different, marked on the map as grey weathers, weathers being sheep, because from a distance they look like a flock of sheep, all asleep this morning, some split in fascinating ways, some, look at this one here, I love that one. Um, 20th century sculptors like Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth used to come out and sketch the Sarsons in Wiltshire and you can see the similarity with some of their, uh, some of their creations because they do, some of these look like recumbent figures and each one has a, a fascinating uh, geometric shape. Um, and there's no real pattern to them. Some of them have been arranged uh, into uh, odd circles and things by, by, by people, but they're, they're just, they've just tumbled out like dice and um, a good place to consider the, the chaotic nature of, of, of our uh, life and times. How are you since I last uh, uh, spoke with you in July? Um, it feels as if we're entering another season of, of challenge, doesn't it? And uh, I, I've just been reading from the Bible, from the book of Isaiah, where God says to his people, why do you question what I'm up to, in effect? Does the clay say to the potter, uh, your work has no handles? <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> your work has no handles. Um, and and it, it feels at the moment, certainly to me, very hard to get a handle on things. Like, how do you get a grip when everything is changing uh, so regularly? And so it's a good scripture for today to remember to, to trust ourselves, uh, to put ourselves on God's wheel, so to speak, and ask that he makes something of our times. Uh, uh, it would have been the first thing that our ancestors did was to look for the purpose and the will of God, his, his blessing or his judgment in the way things tumbled out. Um, we're less ready to do that. We, we understand the, the chaotic nature of life. Uh, um, and, but I, I, I've wondered a lot over, over this summer whether there isn't more to consider about uh, discerning what, what the times are saying about us and what, what God is uh, what God is up to in this and today I'm, I'm encouraged to, to trust him to that, that he has a handle on things even if I can't see where the handles are in his craftsmanship so that's uh, just a short message today uh, to get in touch again and uh, I, I trust today that you know uh, uh, God having a handle on your life and that you may too be able to uh, shape something good in what uh, falls out uh, in the world around you. God bless you as you go to ground. Thank you Bishop Andrew for um, that reflection this afternoon. Um, it was very very powerful indeed. Well, uh, 
this coming weekend is the final weekend of the church's year and um, several of you have been so kind in uh, providing lo lots of um, fruit uh, for our community Christmas cake and um, although we can't stir it in church um, we were a while ago um, stirring it up um, in Cheryl's home for the benefit of this program so you could see um, it all happening and the antics that we got up to. Hello everybody, today uh, I'm here at Cheryl's house and we're making the uh, Christmas community cake. In medieval times, uh, the custom was on the 25th Sunday after Trinity, um, that that's the final Sunday of the church's year before we start Advent together, um, we would make a cake or uh, in some families the making of the Christmas pudding. But for our benefit uh, today we're going to be making a Christmas cake which we hope when it's all cooked, which Cheryl is cooking for us, uh, we're going to give to members of our congregation at Christmas and those who perhaps are isolated and not able to come and who would like a piece of uh, community Christmas cake. Not sure um, how many ingredients are in this cake, Cheryl's going to tell us, um, but in the old days tradition says that uh, 13 ingredients should go into the cake, um, 12 of those ingredients representing the 12 apostles and the, 13, the 13th ingredients representing Jesus himself. Today when we stir the cake we're going to be stirring it thinking of the fruits of the Spirit. You know that, that great passage from the uh, St Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Let's, uh, let's go over to Cheryl now. Hi Cheryl, thank you for inviting us into your home. And now you're going to tell us all about a bit about how you have made the Christmas cake and how you're going to uh, get it ready for us to stir. Right. Well, until you said, I never realised about the 13 ingredients. <laughs> and I've just had a look, and we do actually have 13. Lots yes, of good, good, good. So made up of glacé cherries, peel, flaked almonds, mm. ground almonds, carrots, sultanas, raisins, gluten-free plain flour, so yes. you can have some, <laughs> uh, spices, butter, sugar, eggs, and then the rind of lemons and oranges. Actually going to end up a three tier Fantastic. Christmas cake. Thank you to everybody who's donated, by the way. Been so generous. So, Cheryl. And we've also got Ooh. a whole bottle of brandy, which will do both cakes. So it's going to be a spiritual in more ways than one. <laughs> what a way <waste> splitting <laughs> it in Christmas cake. <laughs> but it only goes in after the cake's baked. Right. And then every Sunday I will feed the cakes with the brandy. So that by the time I marzipan and decorate them, it's actually quite alcoholic inside. And it, it helps keep the cakes. Not that they're going to last very long. <laughs> but properly soaked in brandy, they can last eight, nine years. Wow. So, but as I say, I don't think these will last that long. Okay. So in each of these, I have all the dry ingredients which I've already mixed because it actually takes quite a while to put all this together. Um, I don't know how long I was doing it yesterday, for it, you know, four or five hours to do it. So this is all the dry ingredients and then this morning I have mixed together the butter, the eggs and the mm. sugar which has to go in and then Andrew has to get his muscles out to stir it all. So here we go. First one. Now I'm not like TV chefs, leaving half the mixture in the bowl. <laughs> Get right this side. <laughs> so it all has to go in. I hate it when you see these chefs and they leave half the mixture in the bowl. I think it's so wasteful and it tastes much better cooked in the cake and thrown in the bin. Oh. 
I think we're going to get you a Saturday morning spot. <laughs> Your arrival for James Martin. I Joe. don't think so. <laughs> Right, there's that one ready for you to have a stir. Or right. So as I stir, I'm going to remember the fruits of the spirit. So this is the first stir for generosity. The second stir for kindness. The third stir for peace. We don't we need a lot of that? For love. For joy, for self-control, get that brandy away from me, <laughs> <laughs> patience, oh, Philip needs some of that. <laughs> and faithfulness. Shall I give it a bit more of a stir? Oh yes, give it a good stir. These are well combined, ready to go in the tins, which I have already prepared. Gosh, this is looking lovely. Mmm, you can smell the fruit. Wow. There we go. Yeah, no, that's not mixture. Sure. It'll get right down to the bottom. Oh, this right, is okay. why we like stir up Sunday, because by the time God. 20 in the congregation have stirred, it is actually getting stirred. I think our children at church last year did a much better job than I'm doing. And if they're watching today, you'll turn next year, guys. And then we'll add a little bit of caramel. Mm. Right, and stir again. Stir again. When does the brandy go in? <laughs> some, some people put it in the mixture, but as it evaporates with the cooking, I think it's then lost. So I think it's much better to put it in once the cake's done, because it doesn't have a chance to go anywhere. It just marinates the fruit in the cake. Now you'll get right to the bottom. Come on, I can see lots of flour. Can you? Yep. Oh, you need muscles to do this. <laughs> it's a workout. <laughs> Keep going. People do it with machines these yes, days. Uh, I don't have machines this size. Oh. Which is why it's in these two big containers. Because no bowl is big enough to put this in. I think there needs to be another gift of the spirit. Strength. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done a really good job of this. Well, tell you what, I'll swap. I'll do a bit of that one and you do this one. Well, well, do I have to do more? Yes, this is the second cake because people have been so generous with their ingredients. Philip, are you coming in to do something? <laughs> I'm not that strong. <laughs> Gosh. So, I know this is a community Christmas cake, but you know, when they used to make... When people used to make Christmas puddings, yes. they used to put money in them, didn't yes, they? Yes, yes. So I can remember as a child, it was the only time my mother went to the pub to get a bottle of... Um, no, it wasn't stout. What was it? Um, barley wine right. for the Christmas puddings. And we had sixpences in our Christmas puddings. But after a couple of years when my father didn't get one and then sulked for about two days, <laughs> she put the six pieces in after it was cooked <laughs> at regular intervals around it <laughs> made sure he got the six pence so he didn't sulk. But in those days we had to um, stone the raisins. They didn't come ready to, done as they do now. No. Um, we had the, the peel came in like quarters of lemons and oranges and we had to chop all those. The almonds came with their skins on, so you had to put them in boiling water and then chuck the skins off and chop the almonds. So it's very much easier today. This one's done now, so well done, Andrew. But part of the, the joy of looking forward to Christmas is <coughs> actually getting ingredients and doing it yourself, isn't it, really? Yeah, I mean, I started this back in Hildersham, where we used to live probably 20 Ooh. years ago. Um, and traditionally there, we cut it on Christmas morning. Uh, but it seems that in Weymouth, people don't come to church much on Christmas morning. I guess it was because we were a small village, the whole village turned up Christmas morning. Um, and the same, he had some then, and the vicar took the rest home and, and uh, took it out when he went on his parochial visits. So. Well, I mean, I think that's a really good idea, and I shall do the same. I think I need a rest. <laughs> oh, dear. I think I need a rest. Yeah, There's lots of ingredients here. Yeah. 
So, okay, uh, what's, what's the weight in total? Let's have a look. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half, eight and a half, nine and a half, ten. Each, each cake says about 11 pounds of ingredients in weight. I don't know what those are metric because I'm a pound now. So, so uh, yes, quite a lot. But I prepared the tins yesterday, so this will be baking in our ovens this afternoon. Wow! So the house will smell. They'll go in for about six hours. Um, six hours? Six hours. A nice slow cook at a low temperature to retain the moistness. Uh, in the cake. Could you eat any of it now? Well, you could, but I'd probably slap your wrists. Because <laughs> then somebody in the congregation wouldn't get a slice because you've eaten it. I know. <laughs> That's true. What were you saying about self control? I know. Andrew? Well, it, it was just one of the gifts of the spirit, which is really important. So, self control means you don't eat the mixture. Right, okay, good. fine. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's that's absolutely lovely, and uh, we look forward to receiving a piece of this, as I hope everyone will, as they come to church at Holy Trinity this Christmas. And uh, a huge thank you to Cheryl for inviting me today and for doing the cake for us. You're very welcome. Well, as it's Stir Up Sunday, Cheryl and I are now going to say that lovely collect, that wonderful collect for the 25th Sunday after Trinity in the uh, Book of Common Prayer. So let us pray. Stir, Stir up, up, we beseech thee, thee O Lord, Lord, the wills the of, of thy faithful, faithful people, that they plenteously bring forth the fruit of good works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, that was really great fun. Thank you once again um, for the opportunity to take part in um, stirring that, uh, all those ingredients. And um, I didn't realise quite what a weakling I was. But of course, Stir Up Sunday is is really about stirring us up uh, not necessarily the cake but us as people as we wait for the coming of a savior well now we're going back to devon uh, once again and you know what i'm like for going into the most remotest communities it took me ages to find this little village um, Many, many of those Devon roads are windy and obscure. Um, many times I've had to stop and reverse back for tractors and all kinds of things. But I got there in the end. Delightful little village. Um, but the uh, comment of the, the post lady was hilarious. Well, I'm looking over the Devon countryside again today somewhere between Holsworthy and Torrington, looking out from the village of Newton St. Petrock, which has a population of about 163 people. In the 17th century, it was the home of England's first female physician, Prudence Abbott Potter. But it's most well known, it's famous for its landmark, this wonderful oak tree at the bottom of the church and on the corner of the village. The village church is delightful. Here it is. This is the church of St Petrock. It was built in the Middle Ages and its little bell tower has three bells which dates back to 1350. It was restored and enlarged back in 1887. There are 700 years of Christian history on this site. The first vicar was registered here back in 1270 and the patrons of the living were the abbot and convent of Buckfast Abbey until the first act for dissolution of the monasteries in 1536. 
As we look at the church porch here, look at this lovely slate sundial dating back to 1723. You know, our parish churches provide a very important record of past centuries of our history, as well as being living witnesses to the Christian faith today. North Cornwall was protected from the Saxon invaders coming by the Cornish Peninsula and the peat marshes of the uplands of Bodmin and Dartmoor. And the exposed west coast allowed the recently formed Irish church to become established throughout the area. And like most of Devon and Cornwall missionaries, like the patron of this church, St Petrock, came with others from Ireland to convert the pagan West Country. Hence, the patron saint of this church was named St Petrock. It was a lovely day for my visit today and uh, you will see how beautifully kept the churchyard is and wherever you look around this little village you will see countryside. The lovely tower has two tiers and those beautiful pinnacles. It's in very very good order this little church no vegetation creeping up and the roof has been recently restored. I also noticed uh, around the churchyard you can climb over the hedges and uh, and you can see footpaths going out um, across the fields. Goodness knows where they go because I was uh, quite lost when I reached this village. In fact, even the local post woman, when I asked her where Torrington was, said, I don't know my Ansem, I'm from Allsworthy. So, a beautiful little church. And as we move inside um, the building, we see the nave and the high altar and that beautiful stained glass window depicting the passion of our Lord. And here um, the choir stalls, these are made from the old um, rude screen as is this pulpit. The emblems of the passion um, have been put into the panels of this pulpit. The font, this lovely, lovely little font, um, is Norman. I'm finishing today by showing you this wonderful casket containing the bones of St Petrock, which you can find interred in the wall of Bodmin Parish Church in Cornwall. I can remember over 20 years ago attending as a priest the service for that interment into a glass panelled wall which you can visit today, the bones of St Petrock. It's been a lovely visit to Newton St Petrock today and I hope you've enjoyed it also. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, quite true, what I said. The, the, the post lady really had no idea how I was to get out uh, uh, on back on to the road uh, towards Biddeford and Torrington because she only ever does the route from Holsworthy to uh, the small communities uh, finishing at Newton St Petrock. So she really didn't have a clue. Um, there you go. So now let's uh, let's have our hymn today. We love the place, O oh God. And our hymn is We Love the Place, O oh God. Um, and it's 160 in the red books. <laughs>
Well, we've uh, come to the end of uh, our more tea vicar for this week. I hope you'll join me again next week for our final more tea vicar for this year and continue uh, to join me on a Thursday um, for the next four weeks in Advent for our Circle of Light uh, program. But until we meet again, um, may God bless you. Thank mm-hmm. you.